Welcome to Authors of the Pacific Northwest, where we connect authors with new listeners and provide advice to aspiring authors on the business of writing. I'm your host, Vicki J. Carter. Hi there, podcast listeners. Thank you so much for coming back to the Authors of the Pacific Northwest podcast. And we have something very special for you. Um, So listeners, if you listened to us before, we're doing something new um, starting this new year, bringing in some new topics and some other individuals. So I am thrilled to introduce you to um, our a guest today. Her name is Susan DeFreitas. I think I got it right. Woo-hoo. <laughs> and she is a collaborating editor and marketing consultant for Indigo Editing. And so Susan, how about you say hi to our listeners? Hello, everyone. I'm very happy to be here on this podcast. Yeah, well, we are thrilled to have you. I think you have a lot that you can share with us. Um, and so getting started, when I have, I have a lot of authors that have come on self-published and in, or independent authors, um, self-publishing, or I have, um, I have traditional authors too. And the one topic that sometimes wraps around is editing. I mean, we, we end up talking about it. So the listeners know we talk about the art of writing, you know, the whole process. And um, so I'm so glad to have you here because what I would love to pick your brain on are some of the, um, the different types of editing. So I know you and I mentioned back in email back and forth that there's several types. And and so we talked about reader response, developmental editing, line editing, and proofreading. So Susan, can you clear up those four for us with some definition around each type? Absolutely. So um, the easiest way to look at it um, is... um, Three basic um, types of editing, developmental editing, line editing, and proofreading. And um, both of, you know, you mentioned the reader's response and developmental editing. Those are actually two different types of developmental feedback. So I'll start there because that is my area of specialization. I'm a total story geek Mm -hmm. and I am all about, um, you know, what it's going to take to help the author craft the um, uh, the most possibly com- the most compelling possible story, uh-huh. um, and you know that applies either to um, authors who are interested in sending their manuscript out for consideration by traditional. Uh, by literary agents and uh, acquisitions editors, Mm -hmm. and also for people who are interested in um, self-publishing. You know, either way, you really want to make that story as strong as possible. Oh, frankly, before you begin tinkering with the sentences, right? Yeah. Because that's, um, that way you're going to be using your time most efficiently. So a reader's response is equivalent to, um, you know, if you were working with an acquisitions editor at, um, you know, um, a publisher's, um, it's the equivalent of an editorial letter. And you'll hear many um, traditionally published authors talk about receiving that editorial letter for the first time, talking about how long it is. Oh my gosh, it was 12 pages long. There were a million bullet points. Um, and, you know, many people dread receiving that letter, mm-hmm. but um, they, a lot of people really love it too, because um, that is, you know, that letter, that reader's response shows that your, uh, you know, the editor has really gotten down in there in story world with you to, um, to point out you know, how the story could be strengthened, whether it's you've got a plot hole over here or somebody's name changes or a character arc isn't as well developed as it could be mm-hmm. or a theme um, seems present, but not all that well developed. The, you know, it's the view from 10,000, um, but it can also be a kind of a punch list of things that, um, you know, you, you need to address in revision to really make the book as strong Okay. As it could possibly be. 
So that's yeah. the editorial letter or a reader's response, which is um, the first type of developmental feedback. Okay, let me ask you one question because wow. here's the novice here in me. This is going to point out to everybody how novice I am. Um, do those reader responses only come from editors or is it from like I hear all the time beta readers? So do editors get beta readers to help them? They get a group. Oh, well, God bless your beta reader if they're yeah. willing to give you that level of feedback. <laughs> You know, because this, this is really, um, it, it takes a lot of hours and a lot of thinking about a book, um, and being very invested in it, um, Mm -hmm. to provide this level of feedback. And frankly, you know, it tends, this is where you really see a developmental editor's experience shine. Okay. That that makes sense now. (laughs) It's, it's not, they're not just responding to an issue that they see in your book. They've seen it before Mm -hmm. and they have a very well-developed sense of intuition about how to address the issues that they're seeing um, in your book. Um, So So. it's maybe along the same lines, but more professional and usually frankly longer. (laughs) And and I would assume, because I hear this often, that's where the biggest cost of editing is for an author is because that's where, like you said, the most investment from on the editor's side is to really help find those areas that need to really be corrected with the storyline, which take time. So that may be where the most cost could be. Well, yes and no, because, you know, the type of, well, now I'll go on to the second type. Okay, great. Okay. The second type of developmental feedback, it does not take the form of a letter. It takes the form of track changes. It's actually on your manuscript. Oh, right? mm-hmm. Well, all the rest of, of the world has, has uh, moved ahead with all sorts of um, wonderful newfangled technology and applications. The publishing world still uses Microsoft Word and because of track changes, right? I tra- um, I'll, just, I'll be out there right now. I hate track changes. <laughs> I, use them, I use them all the time at work when I have to collaborate and it drives me. Better up. or worse, oh, yeah. it's the standard. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, and because, you know, it really just works um, so well for multiple revisions by multiple people. Yeah. It keeps all of those, you know, mm-hmm. every little thing straight. You can imagine how easy it would be to lose you know, um, the markup of a suggested period, for mm-hmm. instance, on a, on a handwritten or a hand oh, yeah. markup manuscript. Yeah. Um, whereas in track changes, you know, you just go to the next, the next uh, change, next editorial mark, and there it is. Mm-hmm. Um, so this type of editing actually takes quite a bit longer because it's much more detailed, right? Mm -hmm. So this type of developmental feedback, it also deals with the content of the story, but it's down there in the nitty gritty at the level of the scene, Mm -hmm. the level of, uh, uh, you know, pointing out, you know, in the the broad view of a, of a reader's response or editorial letter, you know, your editor might've pointed out like, you know, this character, it seems a little two dimensional or this uh, character arc could be deepened or this theme could be more fleshed out in in actual developmental editing your editor will point out right where they see oh i see okay you know, uh, that happening or an opportunity to address it or you know slips in point of view um difficulties with with time the way you're managing time uh, always a big uh question both in uh, fiction and in memoir. Mm -hmm. Um, So again, it deals with the content of the story, but at a, at a much more detailed level and it involves markup on the manuscript itself. So that can be time consuming as well on the other side of it. Yeah. Uh, Okay. That is very clear to me. Thank you for defining those two. Let me ask this other one question for you, Mm -hmm. because this is the burning question I have as a writer, as I'm working on, a draft and I'm working with really great strong writers in my writers group I still beat myself up and I wonder in the back of my mind I have this idea that there is people out there that send stuff to editors and publishers and they're perfect and they're great and they're just these glossy beautiful (laughs) novels right out of the bat and then I hear different often that you know even there's never a perfect novel out there so tell me tell me a little bit it where is it in the middle from, from what your perspective is that there are some really great polished work that you see, but there's more 
others that need more work. You know what I mean? Well, you know, I, (laughs) you know, as a, as a independent editor, as a collaborative editor, I am somebody that writers hire to help them with their quote unquote crappy first drafts, you know? (laughs) I'm in there with the trenches, um, in the trenches with the author. Um, oftentimes I also have people come to me with extremely polished drafts that have been through multiple revisions and many beta readers and critique groups. Mm -hmm. And maybe they even worked with a mentor in the MFA program on it. You know, Mm -hmm. I see the whole gamut. Mm -hmm. Um, I will say I have never, encountered a manuscript that I could not find any way to make better. <laughs> well, that makes me feel better, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> it's really absolutely, true. It's absolutely true, you know, yeah. and that might be, you know, from, from great to fabulous, or it might be from like, oh my gosh, what is this to like, okay, this is competent. And this is a competent yeah. book, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. They say an editor can make a book about 15% better. I would pride myself by saying I would like to think I could manage, help somebody manage more like 25% improvement. Yeah, yeah. I find that low number. So competitive that um, that degree of difference, frankly, sometimes even 1% or 2% difference can make a huge um, difference in, um, you know, whether the book finds its readers, makes its way to the market, and, and frankly, where it um, makes its way to the market and how. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> well, that does make me feel better because I, I do know I'm learning that, you know, it's, it's a, your first draft is not going to be the final story. It's not going to, it should never be the final, you know, it, there's so many opportunities to make it better and, and it will be edited and it should be edited and you're going to have to bring others in to help you. That was the scariest part for me. <laughs> when I start, you know, like I'm going to do this and I'm going to need. And I think it's such a destructive fallacy, you know, about it's really so common that, we really think that that's how it works, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's like this, this myth about a writer who like thinks and thinks and thinks and they have writer's block and they're a tortured artist and they're like walking on a windswept beach, yeah. you know, oh, yeah. just turning it over and not writing and not writing and not writing. And then suddenly, you know, they lock themselves in an attic and they turn out, you know, a major work of literature in the first draft and that is so that there's no resemblance to the the actual process for most writers for most writers um and and this is a reflection of the editing process too I think I don't know um maybe I'm unique in that I'm a person who has actually refinished their own floor (laughs) No, I love you. You're like me and my husband. I helped my husband sand our entire floor, so I get it. You start with the biggest, the big equipment and the biggest stuff, right? And you get it all, you know, sand it down. But what is left? You can't get the corners with the major equipment like that with a big floor sander. Then you spend at least as long doing the edges by hand as you did you know, getting most of the floor done with the big yeah. equipment, like that. And, and once you've just gotten the edges and maybe your closets and all the places that the big floor sander didn't fit, once you've done the labor intensive work of getting that all even with what you did with the floor sander, then, you know, you work it down with progressively finer sand. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And, and so, okay, this is a good segue, right? So yeah, yeah. and I'm I'm loving that analogy. So every time I think about editing, I'm thinking that analogy now for the future. Thank you so much. (laughs) Little editing is the big floor sander, right? We're going to, we're going to deal with the big stuff first. We don't want to monkey with details until we've gotten the the big things in place. Well, the next level is a line editing. So Mm -hmm. now we're going to start working on those details. And um, line editing absolutely is most of this editing, which is grammar, punctuation, spelling, syntax. Um, 
But it's also um, some things that are a little harder to explain, like smoothness and clarity at the level of the line. Mm -hmm. Um, And this, you know, those last two attributes really make a difference in how... uh, how accessible the the work is, how easy it is to read, you mm-hmm. know? So every writer knows, you know, how, how many redundancies crop up when you're writing, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> you, know, you said it over here. You use the same word three times on the same page. You said it this way over here. You said it that way over there. You don't, on second thought, when you look back and read it, you don't need to say that, you know, Jim was a hunter because it was implied by something that you said before. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's very common, you know, to have these sorts of redundancies and it's very common not to be able to, to catch all of them yourself Mm -hmm. um, because you wrote the thing, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's why it can be really helpful. Um, not to have an editor who's not only really good with grammar, punctuation and spelling, you know, and the intricacies of the Chicago manual of style, Mm -hmm. but also, you know, in the basics of what creates smooth, uh, engaging, compelling, forceful use of language. Because again, you know, your reader has so many other things to do, Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. you know, that are so much more pressing than to read your book, you know, whether again, I work with, um, memoir and fiction you know and those are both one is a completely made-up story and the other one is like you know deep details about a stranger's life you know exactly. yeah yeah that can be twisted around with some fiction in there too so <laughs> but you know let's just say the toast that has popped up or the dog that needs to be fed or the kids that need you know attention all of these concerns are much more immediate to your reader than um, their need to read your book. You, you need prose that is strong and forceful enough that it just absolutely sucks them under. Yep. Um, yep. And so, you know, a lot of people think of editing as just um, what I call comma wrangling. Oh. <laughs> so much of it is That's the commas, so I swear to you. Oh, our lead editor um, and founder, Ali Shaw at Indigo, named her cat Kama. That's hilarious. <laughs> a lot of what we do is with commas. Um, but, I, I got to jump in here real quick. One of the teachers that I worked with at, at the college, so I'm a university instructor, and she was the grammar you know, instructor. And um, she used to tell her students at the very beginning, and every time I write, I think of this, um, at the very beginning of the class, she says, oh, put your hands together and make a cup and look at that. That's how many commas you have in your lifetime that you're allowed to use. <laughs> and every I mean, it's so true because people are very calm. I'm comma happy. I have to remember that analogy when I go writing. <laughs> it's just like once those are used up in your lifetime, you're done. So don't get comma happy. <laughs> oh, well, gosh, you know, that's sage advice in some ways, but it will also make you want to throw you know, your book across the room at your uh, proofreader or copy editor. And I'll tell you why. <laughs> yeah, do tell, because we're, I think we're saying, well, you write into proofreading, right? That's the next one. Sure. <laughs> Here's the thing, you know, all of us learned uh, where to put the, the periods and the commas and et cetera, you know, in uh, grammar school. Mm-hmm. We call it grammar school. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That was the last time most of us studied grammar. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> and so people tend to think that there is just one way to, to handle punctuation and, and spelling and various other things. But the terrible truth of the world, I'm, 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 I'm revealing it here. Oh my gosh, I'm excited. <laughs> There, there are different styles and they apply to different types of writing. Uh So if you're writing um, journalism, you're going to be using AP style. Uh Uh AP style was developed to use as little space as possible because it was developed for newsprint, right? Uh So that's a very comma adverse style. Uh (laughs) 
Yeah. Um, if you are writing a nonfiction book, you will likely be um, using MLA style, which is an academic style that's really designed to show that you've done your homework and you've backed up all of your arguments and uh, your sites all in a row. Um, But if you're writing a fiction or memoir, um, you're likely the applicable style is the Chicago Manual of Style. And the Chicago Manual of Style loves commas. Oh, that's hilarious. See, now I never even uh, leave. There is, again, it's, it's all about this consistency absolutely yeah. across the manuscript. My take on the Chicago Manual of Style is that it was developed so that the reader can read at a very fast pace with complete clarity and without ever having to stop to reread something because the meaning of a sentence might be ambiguous, right? Oh, uh-huh. Why independent clauses are separated by commas. And that's why, you know, quite a number of other things. Um, mm-hmm. That's my take on the logic behind it. And it works really well hmm. um, for creating that totally immersive reading experience because, again, uh, going to, to fiction and memoir you don't want your reader to remember that the toast has popped up and that the dog is whining and that, you know, their, Mm -hmm. their kid wants them to look at their picture. No, you want your reader to just absolutely feel like they are there Mm -hmm. in the world of the story. What an absolutely awesome tip and a well-defined on the different editing types that you know that you work under as an editor and that authors should know about and the part that really kind of makes me scratch my head so I teach I've taught MLA and we are currently in the college that I work in is the college of IT so we are heavy on APA and I'm a librarian so I know MLA and APA pretty darn well Mm -hmm. I have never personally really dug deep with Chicago because I've never had to write anything the Chicago style and I did learn the journalistic style early on as a as a young adult in high school when I worked for the newspaper so now I'm thinking I have a huge gap in my education. I need to jump in and, and figure that out before I submit my work anywhere to anybody. <laughs> well, the thing is, you know, if you're if you're working with an editor, um, you know, and you should. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. It's all, it's all to do list. <laughs> you know, again, uh, we're talking that analogy with the finer levels of sandpaper. Mm-hmm. You know. Um, the the person who did the line editing, you know, they will do their level best to catch all of the the punctuation, the grammar, the spelling, all that stuff, in addition to really just helping you make your prose more muscular and immersive um, and, and strong. But that proofreader is an absolutely necessary final line of defense mm-hmm. because there are always things that slip through and readers always catch them. Right. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, they do. So, you know, regardless of whether you're working with a traditional publisher or whether you're self publishing, you should absolutely have someone other than you who is the final line of defense Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) and they will be happy to, you know, enforce <laughs> yes exactly this particular style um but of course it's it's not a bad idea to um acquaint yourself with it mm-hmm. um, well i i find this interesting because i we just got done in my area we hosted and this is how i met you because i asked you to to be part of a additional panels um but we hosted a panel with um indie authors, three indie authors that I've met through the podcast, and we brought them to our public library, and they shared their journey of publishing and their their journey through writing with interested community members. We had two sessions, very full. It was a wonderful experience. One of the um, authors, she was so great, Denise Kawai. So if you guys are my regular listeners, you probably, you heard her on the podcast, and she she was talking about getting an editor and, and working with an editor, and for self-publishing, there's a lot of cost involved on the, the back end. And she was she mentioned it when I love this and I want to share this on the podcast. So Denise, you're getting credit for this. She talked about how it's an investment in you as well. So when people think about 
you know, if they're going to go back to college and learn a new skill or a new trade, they're going to put the money into that. And Mm -hmm. a lot of people are a little bit hesitant to put out money for a great editor for their work before they publish. And she reminded them that that's investing in yourself to make sure that your work is fabulous and readers are caught with it. So I think that goes really hand in hand with what you're saying. And it sounds like to me, it's a lot longer process than just maybe one draft through if you're going to do it correct. Oh, sure. And, you know, at, at Indigo, we really, um, how do I say it? We really pride ourselves on offering the same quality and stages of, of editing that a, a author would receive with a big five traditional publisher, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, working through offering those three um, rounds of editing with um, our self-publishing authors, what they're getting out of the, you know, at the end of that is a book that is as professional and as polished as they would get if they had traditionally published it. And as for the expense involved, you know, there's a lot of expense involved with a traditional publisher too. It's just that they are covering it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and I tell people all the time, I wonder because I came from people who listen to my podcast in the past know this. I came from the music industry. And really in any contractual environment with uh creatives where it feels like you're writing getting a contract and you might be getting an advancement my thought from my experience in the music industry is that that advancement is really just a loan (laughs) you're going to be paying for it somewhere (laughs) somehow and um so it's interesting to think that um I don't know where it's going with that but traditional publishing has also changed quite a bit and I'm not sure people have the time in traditional publishing to really spend a lot of time with editing where it might be smarter for even somebody that's interested in going the traditional route should very much look at hiring professional editors. Oh, absolutely. Because it's very competitive. (laughs) Yeah. And you know, again, it's so competitive. It is so intensely competitive that, you know, it makes sense to work with somebody, you know, a professional before you send out that manuscript. Um, yeah, there's yeah. your competition is good. So you need to be, you have to be better. <laughs> you be better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, awesome. Well, Susan, this is such great advice. I'm going to ask a couple more questions and then we're going to not spend a lot of time in, on this one because we're going to come back next week and talk about marketing, which is, another hot topic that every single author and I talk about either on the podcast or when we meet up with each other, there's just a lot of stuff about marketing as much as there is about editing, um, in my opinion. And and so before we close out for today, um, can you give us um, what is the one best tip that you want authors that are listening to this podcast before they've come to an editor? What's the one best tip that you can give them before they um, meet up with somebody or when they're thinking about employing an editor? Well, my best t- tip is this. Do as much as you can to improve the manuscript before you hire an editor, do your own level best to make it the, you know, the, the best that you can imagine it being the book that you wanted it to be, give it to beta readers, work it through your critique group, do all of that before you hire an editor, because that way you're going to get the absolute most out of that editor's professional experience, right? Mm -hmm. You don't want to pay somebody to tell you what you already kind of knew, you know? Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Or or what your, your, you know, your writing friend could have told you, you know, you're hiring somebody with a lot of expertise or you should be. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, you know, make sure you're really using um, that specialized expertise by making it as you know, doing as much as you can see to do um, before you send it to them. 
Such great advice. And it's something that I'm definitely taking to heart. And I will be employing an editor. I can guarantee that. It scares me. And and when I first started this whole journey and I started talking to authors and they were talking about um, hiring an editor, I got a little panicky and scared at that idea. But you have totally softened my heart towards it, that it's a collaborative effort. I love collaborative work. And I've done plenty of it in my own working life but when it's your own baby your own story it's kind of scary so um i love the analogy that you gave to me and i'm going to definitely remember that analogy as the sanding the floor so if any of you have not sanded a floor and you're an author and you need to understand this you might as well get your big sanders out and start working on your floors (laughs) and and here's one thing that we i wanted to wrap back around about that whole analogy my husband and i did this in our home and uh, we have very fond memories of me standing on the big sander trying to get it to go around. We did it the first time through, but then we stained it wrong. Oh. And, and when the stain dried, that's when, and it came out wrong and it looked terrible. That's when I stood there and I broke and I cried and I'm like, I can't do this anymore. I just can't do it anymore. And we ended up sanding it again and starting from scratch again. Yeah. And that, that's such a great, um, for me, thinking that there might, there can be a point even when you're working with somebody where you might have to go back to the drawing board to make it the strongest story you can make and the most beautiful story. That is absolutely true. And, you know, I will, I will preface, I want to qualify what I just said about making your manuscript as good as possible. Sure. Yes. I mean, making the content of it as good yeah. as possible rather than the sentences, right? Yeah. You're going to start with the developmental work. Um, but you know, when you come back around to, to the next round of editing, to the line editing, you know, the same advice holds true there, get the sentences as good as you can Mm -hmm. before you give it to your line editor. That way you'll get the most out of your line editor. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't, I just don't want your reader, your, um, listeners to think, oh, I have to make all of these sentences perfect before I send it to an editor. That's not what I mean at all, Mm -hmm. because that might be like putting the wrong stain (laughs) Oh yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like, oh, sorry, you know, yeah. we're going to have to, the, this content has to change. So all of these beautiful sentences, you know, they might be uh, belong to another story, but they don't belong to this one, right? That's a great analogy. I'm glad we had that analogy to share with each other because, you know, <laughs> the stain that we put on the first time turned out a milky color. So you could not see the beauty of the wood at all. Mm-hmm. And we did not realize that until it dried. And then it, but the second one made the wood stand out gorgeous. So, so awesome. Great. I'm glad you brought that around and and clarified that. So, so great. And I'm actually now very excited to get to the stage with my draft where I can work with an editor. Cause I think that's a developmental part as a writer that you have to really step through. You have to embrace that to be the best storyteller you can be. Mm -hmm. So You know, except, you know, when you've reached your edge and think, you know, you might have something in your, I, I, you know, this doesn't quite feel right, but I don't know how to make it better. That's fine. Mm -hmm. You've reached the edge of what you know, all the same, your editor is going to be there for you. And I guarantee she's going to have ideas that you probably didn't think of. Yeah. Yeah. So you're not alone. Um. <laughs> That's good to know, right? Yeah. So good to know. And here's another tidbit I wanted to kind of chit chat with you a little bit about. I hear this often because, you know, I have heard horror stories and those horror stories, I think, uh, is what um, feeds the fear of individuals when it comes to working with others in their books and their work. And the two things that I'm finding that are very valuable, and you can maybe help clarify this before we go out today, is one, um, should you be really trying to concentrate on finding an editor that really functions and works well in your genre? And two, can you talk a little bit about the relationship, the interpersonal relationship that you have to have with a writer and editor to make it successful? And we're going to probably dive more into that on the third episode, I'm sure, but it's okay. Yeah, I could go on and on. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah, <laughs> I, I have received many, many clients who bear the scars of previous yes founders yes. and editors, and that always just makes me sad. Uh, quite honestly, you know, there are editors who are very technically good, but they lack the soft skills 
so-called soft skills, the people skills, Mm -hmm. you know, they, they get mad at the book or they forget it. There's a person on the other end of it, you know? Yeah, no. Yeah. Yeah. So it really needs to be somebody who is both, you know, very smart about, um, publishing about, but also somebody who really, yeah, has those interpersonal skills and you can find that out, you know, often by just having a, a, sometimes you can tell via email. Sometimes you might want to have a quick phone call with Mm -hmm. that editor. Mm -hmm. You can usually tell any, any um, editor worth their salt should offer you a free sample edit. Mm -hmm. You should be able to tell from the tone of their comments, um, you know, whether they, they know how to communicate, you know, in a a kind and professional way. It's a Mm -hmm. basic a prerequisite and a a lot of not everybody has it quite honestly Mm -hmm. Um, and number two yeah somebody who understands your genre is always always a plus um because there are certain conventions um to genres that are important to know especially if you want to go for traditional publishing Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well awesome susan you have been such a Uh, inspiration for me to step forward into the new phase of the journey for myself. And I hope that this conversation has also inspired some of my listeners. A lot of my listeners are readers and maybe it's inspiring for readers to know how much your writers go through to get that book in your hands. (laughs) It's not, it's a labor of intense love and work. Um, But for aspiring um, writers like myself, hopefully this, this puts some it, you at ease that, that this is just another part of the process like it's doing for me so so I really appreciate and before we go out do you have anything else you would like to share about those this particular process knowing that I'm bringing you back next week and we're going to talk about marketing uh, you know just remember our ridiculous floor sander analogy <laughs> that's great every every iteration every pass through that manuscript makes it just a little better I love it. Well, that's a great analogy. And so we will remember that. And so next week, listeners, we're going to have Susan back. We're going to talk about marketing. And then the following week, we get a third week with her. And we're going to, she's going to share with us some of the more interesting stories of her best clients, which she's not going to tell their names, of course, and maybe some of the more challenging clients so that we can learn from her eyes um, how we can be the best clients for somebody working as an editor. So, so Susan, thank you so much for being here. And I look forward to talking with you next week. Thank you so much, Vicki. Thank you for listening to the podcast. We hope you enjoyed the episode as much as we did. Follow us on social media and sign up for our newsletter where you can be entered automatically each month to win a signed free copy of a book from an author that's appeared on the podcast. You can find out more at our website, www.squishpin.com. And finally, if you're an author in the Pacific Northwest and you would like to appear on the show, you can find out more on our website. So until next week, I hope you enjoy the journey. This is Vicki J. Carter signing off.